Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Hello, everybody. This is Eddie again from House of the Unusual for another weekly exciting podcast. Um, as you know, we have embarked in a new format. What we do now is we record half hour once a week, uh, airing Wednesday night at, um, actually when I'm saying Wednesday night, Thursday morning at 3.30 a.m. Uh, so all those that have an early workout, they can listen to us while they're doing their workout. And we'll talk about all the fun stuff. Now after this, the second part of it is going to be a segment where Chuck reads more bone-chilling tales. Today's tale will be the famous Lisey Borden. Everybody knows about her. If you don't, stay tuned for the next 15 minutes after I finish. And you will hear Chuck's fantastic voice as he tells the story of Lisey Borden. Um, now, the reason I was actually excited today is something I got in the mail that I was not really aware that I was going to get that. Uh, I went on eBay and as everybody knows when you're hunting for mail or items and, and you want that one item that you always wanted as a kid but you just never were able to get and in my my case it's, it was always that robot plan uh, you know and I've said it many times I don't know how many times I've said it hoping that somebody might hear me one day and be able to say hey Eddie I got him here you want a copy or you want to you know buy the originals I have them oh that's a dream but you know little by little God has always taken care of me and I go, Jesus, thank you for always being there for me because today is one of those days that I did get a piece of the puzzle. And if anybody used to order from Honor House or Johnson Smith Company, I used to prefer Honor House. Uh, I think Honor House always had the seven foot monsters and the seven foot monster ghost. And as a kid, I, I fell in love with Frankenstein watching Abbott and Costello hold that ghost. Um, and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Hold the ghost was the first one I ever watched. And Meet Frankenstein was obviously the second one. And I watched them over and over. And I thought it was so exciting when I saw the seven foot monster. So you were going to get this seven foot monster or a Frankenstein for only a dollar. Uh, and of course, I would tell the mailman, hey, I'm going to be getting a big box. Because I, I, you know, I envisioned it something like a blow mold. I thought it was like a big, gigantic uh, blow mold. And it was Frankenstein with his hand reaching out. Unfortunately, when I got it, uh, it was only two pieces of plastic. But you know what? When you put that up in a white wall, believe it or not, it scared a couple of people. I remember the super of the building in New York City where I lived. He came up one time and he jumped. He goes, oh, my God, I thought it was a person there. And many a times it scared me, too. <laughs> I was in my room and I would go into the hallway and boom, there was old Frankie there looking at me with his glow in the dark eyes, which were nothing more than two little dots. Well, anyways, the story I was telling is I came across an, um, an ad on eBay about a week ago and they were selling an Honor House catalog. Now, I have many Honor House catalogs. Um, I got them from Mr. Wagman himself, the owner of Honor House, way back in 1986, I think it was. Uh, but anyway, the the thing that was interesting is that this catalog looked like a flyer. And anybody who's aware or is familiar with Honor House, Honor House in the early 1940s and 50s would send a 40, 50, or 60-page catalog. Uh, but then in the 70s, they started sending this uh, 22 by 24 flyers that were printed in both sides filled with all the wonderful ads well over the years of course when i was little i lost mine and um i i don't i can't say i lost it in the fire i had in 1995 because i think i lost that way before that probably as a kid my mom threw it out or or who knows somebody in my house threw it out because i used to keep everything and over time i was able to acquire two of them on ebay of course uh you know i was able to get one and then i the one i got is really nice and everything but it's like from late 1968 69 so it didn't have the monster ghost in it and i remember as a kid having the one with the monster ghost and i really wanted that one so anyway fast forward i came across another one that was being sold on ebay one time and i purchased it and i was shocked it it did have 
the seven foot ghost in it. So I, I was like, wow, maybe it's the one I, I got when I was a kid. And I also like the fact, but it was selling the six foot color Frankenstein uh, and Dracula, you know, the six foot size monsters. It didn't quite have. So I said to myself, it does have the monster ghost, but it might not be the one I had as a kid because as a kid, I remember it had the seven foot Frankie, the plastic version, and it had the seven foot ghost in the catalog. So I went ahead and I bought this catalog and I got it at a crazy low price. When I received it today, the shock of a lifetime. It's probably the one I had as a kid because it does have the monster ghost in it. It has the seven foot Frankenstein in it. And I was thinking of maybe in the site posting. But um, as you guys know, right now, my site, my website is being built i've uh, been talking to my brother over it and we've been working on it um not me actually he's got in his it department uh, in florida working on it and he's waiting for me to give him some information um i haven't sent over all the information yet because i'm still debating you see uh, since I do sell a lot of the novelties, if I have a static website, there's a good chance that a lot of people go to it and then jump and they go somewhere else. Now, if you have a landing page with all your content, such as your podcast on it, uh, your eBay store, your Etsy shop, it's a great thing. I mean, you can have a landing page and, and people will come to your page. And of course, uh, anything in your page, you know, they can link. But I think it's kind of a waste. And I'll, I'll say why, because one, if too many people, let's say, want to go visit your podcast and they go through your page, Google kind of looks as that as not user friendly because they're bouncing off your page. And I found out that the hard way about four years ago uh, or three years ago when I started my podcast, I put it on the front page of my website. And the link was there and I started advertising in Google ads and stuff. All of a sudden, the podcast started getting hits like crazy. So what it did is it kept bouncing, going to my site, and they would go right into the um, podcast. They would go to my site, right? So that was bouncing. So I get a letter from Google a few weeks down the road, a few months maybe, saying that I was in violation. They were going to shut my site down for spamming. And I'm like, what the heck? So, you know, trying to get help, uh, life help in Google is like next to impossible. So what I did is I finally was say I you know wrote him an email and I waited about I think four to five days and I finally got an answer, and I explained to them um, you know why were they or I actually I asked them to explain to me why they're saying that I'm spamming on my website, and they said that there's a lot of people hitting. Then I realized what it was, and I was like wow I thought because in fact at one time I was going to build a site and I figured why don't I use Google Sites. Google, uh, for those that don't know, have, you know, they have their own sites that you can do and they're actually free. And I figure, you know, I'm going to link a couple of the website to it and whatever. So they, some guy that worked in Juju, a, a Google, a project manager said to me, Eddie, if you were to do that, even though the sites are done by Google, the bouncing from one site to the other, it's not good for you. It's going to actually, the web crawlers or search engines, whatever, might penalize you because they'll think that you your your thing is not what they want a user friendly experience. So, having said that, I am stuck in with this situation. I had considered since I do sell on eBay most of my stuff, I had considered uh, linking House of the Unusual directly to eBay. Uh, my brother was against it. He told me, "Why are you going to do that? Your website." And I said, "Okay, let's go." Now he's he's working on a site that's automatic. Uh, I'm talking about he's going to have shopping cart technology, all that stuff, and it's going to import all my products there. Okay, there is an advantage of selling in a site that you own, and that's that you don't have to pay eBay fees or Etsy fees. But at the same time, is you don't have the exposure you're going to get on eBay or Etsy. And, and that's another thing you need to think about. So even though a lot of people, and I'm I'm one of those that get really, uh, I mean, mad when I get eBay fees. Like for example, not too long ago, I sold one of my original Frankenstein's. So I sell this thing for the going price, which was about five hundred and sixty dollars. And you know, I got it. I you know, person paid. And then before I knew it, I, I wound up with about four hundred and nineteen dollars because eBay had this crazy fees of eighty something dollars. And then I said, why are they charging so much? And the reason is because they also have another thing that they charge you to kind of push or to boost your, uh, you know, your auctions. 
And the problem with that is because it could wind up you're paying anywhere from 15, I mean, up to 15.9% oh, as a final value fee. Um, so I got turned off by that. But then I took into account and I said to myself, well, what about if I have a store? If I have a store in a mall, I'm going to pay four, five, ten thousand dollars a month in rent. I mean, I could. So I was figuring, telling myself, I do have an eBay store, but what about if I go to the next tier? Maybe I'll get less fees, but they only go down by, believe it or not, like half a percent. I thought it was going to be a lot more than that. But so my thought was, you know, link it to eBay, put all my products on eBay, and then people, you know, can go through the store and I'll explain whatever and, and run it. But you know what? It's true what my brother said. You have to have a static website to know, to make your web presence. Now, my first site that I had, I had a, a link with SS Adams, the company that made and manufactured the snake in the nut cans, the joy buzzer, the legendary SS Adams from Neptune, New Jersey. And since David was a good friend of mine, when I, you know, I got everything that was on that uh, site was SS Adams products. So since all the SS Adams were there, anytime I ran out, I would meet up with David since uh, he lived in another state and I would meet up with him along the highway and he would give me whatever I need. If I needed a dozen snakes, a dozen, you know, and I'd fill the gap. Great and dandy. One day the site, for whatever reason, which was um, run out of Canada, the guy that was running the site got penalized from a company because he had stated that he was hosting the sites and technically he really wasn't hosting he was a, a reseller but even though i was only paying 200 dollars or 140 for the whole year so i thought the prices were pretty decent and i was allowed to do as much as maybe uh, five sites on the thing so you know it's it's a shame that after like 10 years of having them uh, you know that happened now the other thing is if you want to see what the site looked like there's a on google there's a thing called wayback machine and if you actually google way back and you put any date in history uh, for the last 20 years since uh, 1998 house of the unusual will show up and you'll be able to see what my site looked like then i i, I transferred the site over to a um a site on wix Wix is a great host and I, you know, it was running phenomenal and I paid for three years and the site, you know, it's getting a lot of hits. I had a forum, I had everything on it, but I decided to pull the plug because Wix got a little bit over too expensive. And my idea is to have a site and sell things that were back in the seventies and let people have a chance to get them without charging crazy fees. Now, a lot of people say, Hey, you're selling the Frankenstein and stuff. You're charging $149 on eBay. But here's the thing. I'm selling those stuff. Not really because I'm making any money on it. I mean, I am making a little bit. But it's it's so little that it's... What I'm trying to do basically is I want people to get a chance of getting them. And what I'm saying is if you go to any Staples or you go to any printer. And you print a life-size poster the way I do. You'll find out they're over $80 a piece. And then you have the eBay fees. So calculate in your calculator, how much am I really paying? And then, or how much am I really making? And the fees are 15% of that. So you got to ask yourself, also shipping. I offer free shipping. How much is it to ship a poster from here to California, let's say, from New Jersey to California? It's almost $15. So what I'm making is just enough that I'm not losing money, but at the same, it's not making a killing. And the reason I explain that is because my thing out there, I mean, I've done this as a hobby for 30 years and also I made some money on the side. But my idea of House of the Unusual is to build a community of like-minded individuals that love collecting, that love um, getting together and talking about our childhood. And I love to bring memories back. What memories am I talking about? I'm talking about the memory that as a kid, you ask your parents, you hound your parents for a dollar or two dollars, whatever it was that you wanted to buy, the x-ray glasses, the the seven-foot ghost, or you want that hot pepper gum, or, you know, any anything you wanted, a hot seat, or snowstorm tablets, and then you sent away for it, and you waited a lifetime. It usually was between two to four weeks, but some companies would send it to you in uh, three to six weeks. Or four to six weeks which was ridiculous i think what they used to do is not i think i actually know they used to do this and they used to ship out by bulk mail they waited to get enough orders so that they could send it out all at once 
and it was crazy. You waited forever. But you know what? The anticipation of waiting and the fun you had when that package came and you ripped it apart, those memories is what makes House of the Unusual what it is today. And I'm willing and I want to keep them. So please, guys, tune in. Keep listening to our podcast. Help us out by spreading the word, by hitting the like button when you go to YouTube or whatever. And I'm going to be posting a lot more YouTubes. And if you guys remember last week, I showed that I obtained the what might be the original Betts ball, the alien ball from the 1970s. So please, guys, tune in. And now... Go ahead and listen to Chuck as he tells the bone-chilling story of Lizzie Borden. Thank you. Okay, we have an interesting story today. It's about none other than Lizzie Borden. No one in American pop culture holds a, a top ranking as the infamous Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden was born on July 19th. 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts. We all know the rhyme. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. We will we will delve into this amazing and bizarre true story today. Lizzie's parents were Sarah and Andrew Borden. Andrew was of English and Welsh descent. He grew up very poor as a young man and struggled financially. He was, he was a descendant of a wealthy family. And I'm not sure of the story behind this, but it's strange that he grew up poor after he was from a uh, wealthy family. But anyway, later on in life, Andrew became very successful in the manufacture of furniture and, strangely enough, caskets, and later a property developer. Fun fact, Andrew was president of the Union Savings Bank and director of the Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Company. Andrew was known for his miserly ways. An example is they did not have indoor plumbing, despite the fact it was available at that time. The Bordens appeared to be a normal family. Lizzie and her sister Emma had a religious upbringing, attending the Central Congregation Church. Lizzie even taught Sunday school and was a member of the Ladies' Fruit and Flower Mission. Lizzie's mother, Sarah, died at the young age of 39 from uterine congestion and spinal disease. Now, I looked this up online. The only thing I can assume, it seems to me anyway, is it was cancer, almost like a a uterine type of cancer. So if you want to check this out, you can. You could look into this, all the viewing people out there. Three years after her death, Andrew married Abby. Uh, This is where the story takes a negative turn. Lizzie did not care for her and called her uh, stepmother, Mrs. Borden. She would not eat with her at the dinner table and was the opinion that Abby married Andrew for his money. Apparently, hatchets played a role in the Borden home way before the murders. Lizzie built a roost for pigeons in their barn in May of 1892. Shortly after, Andrew killed multiple pigeons with a hatchet. He was convinced the birds attracted local children to hunt them. There was an apparent family argument in July 1892, which prompted both sisters to take a vacation in the New Bedford area. Returning, Lizzie went so far as to stay in a local rooming house so you can see there was tension in this family it was not as it appeared to be which often things aren't you know i mean things appear great on the outside but everybody has issues to further exacerbate things andrew gifted real estate to members of abby's family both lizzie and emma at this point demanded rental property from their father which they purchased from him for one dollar Several weeks before the murder, they sold it back to Andrew for $5,000. Now, that's the equivalence in today's value, about $165,000. So, you know, this did not set well 
with this miserly man. <laughs> the night before the murders, the girl's uncle, John Morse, visited the Borden house. Also, a few days prior to the murder, the family was ill. Speculation was that a left-out piece of meat was used for several meals or suppers. Lizzie claimed it was possibly poison, which was directed at her unpopular father. So apparently a lot of people, possibly the people that had rented his properties, did not care for uh, the father. The uncle slept over, stayed for breakfast, and left around 9 a.m. Andrew left for his daily walk after this time. Apparently Lizzie and Emma's chores was to clean the guest room. Abby went upstairs sometime between 9 a.m. and 10.30 to make the bed. Forensics shows that Abby was facing her killer at the time of the attack. The killer struck her numerous times with a hatchet in the side and back of the head. Her face had contusions and bumps from hitting the floor. Supposedly, Andrew returned from his walk around 10.30 a.m. His key, for some reason, would not open the door, so he knocked. Mrs. Sullivan, the maid, opened the jam door, and she testified to this in court. In testimony, Sullivan stated she heard Lizzie laughing upstairs. Lizzie later denied being upstairs. Mrs. Sullivan stated she, uh, she removed Andrew's boots and put slippers on him to lie down on the sofa for a nap. Now, here's the uh, discrepancy. In the murder photos, which you can clearly see online, Andrew is wearing boots. Later, Sullivan said she was on the third floor resting when she heard Lizzie calling from downstairs around 11 a.m. Quote, come down. Father is dead. Someone came in and killed him. End quote. Andrew was asleep when attacked. He was still bleeding profusely, which suggested the attack was recent. The family physician, Dr. Bowen, who lived across the street, came over and pronounced Andrew dead. Interesting facts. Lizzie's answers to police were contradicting. She originally said she heard a groan before entering the house. Several hours later, she told police she heard nothing before entering the house. It is reported that most of the police officers interviewing Lizzie did not like her attitude. She appeared way too calm. She was not checked for blood stains, which is an obvious blunder on the part of the investigation. I mean, can you imagine a, a murder taking place in somebody's house and the police not checking, you know, for, uh, for blood stains or, or gunshot residue, if, it, if it's a gun or something like that? That's just, that's just unbelievable. In the basement, several hatchets and axes were found. One hatchet head with a broken handle, which was assumed to be the murder weapon. Surprisingly, none of these weapons, uh, none of these weapons were removed from the house until the next morning. Lizzie was informed she was a suspect in the murders. At the at the investig at the investigation, Lindsay's behavior was described as being erratic. She often told several versions of where she was in the morning, ranging from reading a magazine to ironing clothes. Lizzie was served with a warrant and arrested. It is said during the trial, Lizzie was stoic and bit her lips. The trial took place on June 5th, 1893. Strange fact. Five days prior to the trial's ending, another axe murder took place in Fall River. What are the chances of this? I mean, really unbelievable. The similarities between the murder uh, were very similar, both of the murders, as noted by the jurors. A Portuguese immigrant was later convicted of this murder. No bloody clothes were found at the Borden scene, but Lizzie's dress was burned by Lizzie at the stove, claiming it had been ruined by brushing into wet paint. And this was witnessed by several people. During autopsy, both victims' heads were removed and the skulls were admitted as evidence during trial. Wow, this piece of evidence really st stuck out to me. I mean, I can't imagine nowadays bringing human skulls, especially one so recent, into the courtroom. 
I mean, they would take pictures or something or, I mean, that would just be way, way too shocking. Okay, after an hour and a half of deliberation, Lizzie was acquitted. Although Lizzie was acquitted, she remained the main suspect for the rest of her life. She continued to live in Fall River for the remainder of her life. She and her sister would eventually become estranged. Now, there's several possible theories that people have put forward, and there's a few books that were written on this matter. So if you'd like to search them online, you can, you can find these. Okay, one theory was that Lizzie was sexually abused by her father, Andrew. Okay, incest at this time would not have ever been discussed. I mean, that was a whole different world over 100 years ago. Things like this just were not talked about. Another theory was that Lizzie was caught in in a sexual twist with her 25-year-old maid, Mrs. Sullivan. So that's one theory that's put out as well. The Uncle John Morse is another option who was indeed a suspect, but they couldn't prove anything. After trial, the Borden sisters moved into a large house in Fall River, Massachusetts. This house Lizzie named Maplecroft. They had live-in maids, a housekeeper, and a maid. Andrew's estate went to both sisters. Lizzie was basically ostracized by the people of Fall Rivers, so she had this stigma for the rest of her life. But she didn't move. That's the thing that's amazing. Several years later, Lizzie was accused of shoplifting. Now, I don't really see any, any, any records of this as fact, but this did pop up online, so you might want to check this out as well. Lizzie died of pneumonia on June 1st, 1927, at 66 years of age. Few people attended her funeral. Her sister, Emma, was put in a nursing home shortly after Lizzie's death. Neither sister married. They laid next to each other in the family plot. So there's an interesting story really worth looking into. This has always fascinated me. And I'm sure you know this, but the Lizzie Borden house is now a bed and breakfast. And my wife and I had actually contact this place because we would like to definitely go there, but it's booked really far in advance. It would be so cool to actually go there and stay there overnight. So that is on my bucket list. We would definitely like to do it. So there you go, folks. An interesting story. Once again, hey, have a spooky evening. <laughs>